Frenchman. He is a, a Fine Gael spokesperson uh, for European Affairs and a member of the Doyle. Thank you very much indeed for being uh, with us. When you listen to what Lord Frost had to say yesterday, is there any chance that what the European Union proposes today can actually solve this dispute? Well, I have no doubt that what uh, Commissioner Sefcovic will propose this evening will absolutely resolve the issues on the ground in Northern Ireland. What the Commissioner did over the last number of months is engage practically with uh, business people, community leaders, politicians, and also with the British officials uh, in the Joint Implementation Committee to address the concerns on the ground and the practical impact of the protocol. Those are the issues that matter, and those are the issues that the European Commission will be presenting an extremely generous package of proposals on this evening. And we would hope that our British colleagues will take the time to study them and engage in them properly, because what we heard in the speech yesterday was quite disappointing, and I think it was premature. But there is still this issue of the European Court of Justice, uh, the point being made by the British government that uh, they went for hard Brexit. That meant leaving European institutions. It seems a bit odd... Uh, that a European institution still has some say over part of the United Kingdom. I think it's a bit odd that the British government have re-entered this as an issue when it was being when it was resolved. This wasn't an issue in the negotiation of the protocol or indeed of the TCA. And here we have belatedly it being brought up. The ECJ uh, governance isn't affecting anyone in Northern Ireland. It is having no impact and it is absolutely impossible to think of the jurisdiction of the EU being governed by an outside body. The ECG has been accepted by the British government. It's part of an international treaty. There's an obligation to it in international law. And I think the fact that it's being re-entered into the discussion at this stage is a red herring. So you think it's bad faith? I think I'm very disappointed, Adam, in the actions of the British government, not just yesterday, but over the last number of months, where we've seen the very government that negotiated this treaty, that won an election on the back of the protocol, an ATC majority, have gone out of their way to continuously trash it. And I remember back, Adam, in, in January, when the European Commission considered invoking Article 16 for maybe three hours until the Irish government and others intervened, and um, that was seen as the worst possible thing to do. And now, on a weekly, if not a daily basis, we have the British government threatening to invoke it, something that wouldn't solve anything. What about what people are calling the Swiss solution? In other words, continuing to have the European Court of Justice having a say in this, but having the ultimate arbitration by a, a mutually agreed independent body. I mean, I appreciate that might be irritating, but it w would be a practical solution, wouldn't it? I don't necessarily agree with that, Adam. Ultimately, what the mutually agreed solution was the existing arrangement that's been entrained in international I mean, treaties. I appreciate that. The obligations but... that the British government have signed up to and the fact that they want to rip up a treaty merely months later is a really worrying pivot. And there isn't a simple solution. You can call it Swiss, Norwegian or otherwise. This British government, sadly, has gone for the hardest possible Brexit despite the referendum itself only having a narrow margin. We said consistently prior to the referendum, during the negotiations, that there was no plan from the hard Brexiteers for what the situation would be in Northern Ireland. Thankfully, we reached a solution within the protocol that resolves the issue that maintains the integrity of the Good Friday Agreement. We're now at a stage that the European Commission are prepared to be extremely flexible to make this work even better for the people in Northern Ireland. And I'm really, at this stage of the debate, to have misnomers and red herrings brought into it, it's really well, quite disappointing. Well, it's not me saying it, it's the uh, Lord Frost who, who, who made this point. And if it comes to it that the British government says our interpretation of Brexit is that we can't accept the ECJ in this role, would you in Ireland, on behalf of the European Union, of which you're a member, be prepared to impose border checks of some kind between the North and the South? Well, I think we're, it feels like deja vu. Adam, I think you and I had this conversation four years ago about this very topic. And essentially, you mentioned Lord Frost, the very man who negotiated this treaty and is now bringing up the issues. We have an agreed international solution to this. The British government have very clear obligations to international law. They cannot simply resile from that on a unilateral basis. And I'd have to ask, Adam, what does it say about this British government and so-called global Britain to the world at large if they're prepared to turn down and turn their back on an international no. treaty with their closest neighbour merely months away? And I will bear in mind that the US President Joe Biden has been consistent on this. And we all remember the reaction of other members of the G7 in Cornwall when the last time this British government tried to muddy the waters on this issue.
Now, I, I hear your feelings on this. I'm just asking you, bearing in mind that we know uh, Mr Johnson's uh, attitude to this. Uh, at the time, he said it was a good deal. Now he said it was forced upon him in unfortunate circumstances and he never intended that there would be any uh, border problems and he told people there wouldn't be. So, you know, you can have your own views on, on, on all of that. I'm just saying if we do get to the point where the British say they can't accept an agreement on this, they don't accept the Northern Irish Protocol, doesn't that leave you in the, in the unfortunate position of in order to uphold your single market, um, putting in border controls. Well, as I said to you four years ago, Adam, it also leaves the British government in an extremely unfortunate position in terms of their commitment, not just as a co-guarantor to the Good Friday Agreement, but also the obligations to the terms of the WTO. No, I, I it's understand, but, but you, yeah, I mean, you know the currents of this. You know that there are people on the unionist side who, to frankly, don't like uh, the aspects of the Belfast Agreement, which lead to more free co for, uh, cooperation with the South. You just heard David Blevins telling us that actually trade routes are already changing. Now, you know, it could be that there's some people, could even be people in the Conservative government who would actually say, well, you know, in the end, uh, if we force them uh, that they have to put in uh, border checks and you haven't denied that you might have to do it, that actually might serve the cause of unionism. No, it definitely wouldn't serve the cause of unionism and it wouldn't serve the cause of anyone who actually cares about anyone on this island. And I'm not denying or confirming that anything could happen. There's a long way and it is a hypothetical at the stage. But what has been consistent, that if the British government resiles on their very clear commitments to an international treaty, there is a series of process of legal obligations and negotiations that would enter into there's no easy fix to this. We have the protocol that provides the solutions to the problems caused by Brexit. The very people you referenced who, yes, were opposed to the Good Friday Agreement, who pushed Brexit the hardest, never had a plan for what happens on the island of Ireland. We have a plan. It's enshrined in international law. And all this nonsense that was foisted upon the Prime Minister is absolutely risible. We had a situation with the backstop. The Prime Minister decided to go back to what we have now in the form of the protocol. It was agreed. He won a general election on the back of it and his very negotiator is now trashing it. Regardless of the opinions of people who've always opposed this or indeed always opposed the Good Friday Agreement, the situation is clear. Everyone is committed to maintaining the open, free-flowing nature of the border on the island of Ireland. That is enshrined in an international peace treaty lodged with the United Nations. It would absolutely be craven of anyone in the British government or beyond to think they can somehow force the Irish government or our European partners, partners to erect checks. We have a much better solution. We will see this evening very, very generous proposals from the Commission that respond to the needs of the people of Northern Ireland. And I'd have to ask at this point, where does the British government figure in responding to the needs of the British, the people of Northern Ireland? OK, thank you very much indeed, Neil Richmond. Uh, let's hope in four years' time we find something else to talk about. And uh, we'll bring you the European Union's news conference announcing its proposals on the Irish Protocol live here on Sky News uh, when it delivers its response. Now, we are expecting that at around uh, half past five this evening, so do join us then. Are you confident you'll get your toys for Christmas? Uh, the message from the government this morning after the major shipping company Maersk announced it was uh, diverting ships from the port at Felixstowe was, uh, because of a backlog and delays, was that you can be. Today, ministers say the situation is improving, uh, but there's still substantial issues getting containers onto land. Felix Stoke Port authorities have said this morning that the situation is improving, which is welcome news. There is, though, clearly a challenging problem, particularly with um, HGV drivers. And not just here, it's across Europe, Poland, US, even China has this challenge. That's why we've been taking steps to address it, whether it is, for example, with more training, 5,000 more places for, for training HGV drivers, making the process more flexible. We're working through these challenges. I'm confident that people will be able to get their, their toys for, for Christmas. Well, let's take a look now at why uh, Felixstowe uh, delays are so significant. The port of Felixstowe handles 36%, that's over a third of UK freight container traffic. Around 2,000 ships dock there each week, each year. Uh, more than 4 million containers pass through Felixstowe every year, which is the equivalent to 11,000 a day. 
And the British International Freight Association has warned that the time a container waits to be picked up at the port has doubled in the last fortnight to just under 10 days. Well, let's go to Sky's uh, Emma Birchley, who is at Felixstowe. And uh, what is the situation there uh, now with this backup? Well, if I just show you the ship that's over my shoulder, it's the Ever Genius. It's a whopper of a ship, 400 metres long, and it takes uh, the equivalent of 20,000 20 foot containers. So you can understand if a ship like this misses its slot or is backed up or, or can't come into port at all, then that has an impact. And the problem is, is that in basic terms, there is too much. Uh, too many goods trying to get into the UK coming in here at Felixstowe than the supply chain can cope with. And we know that Maersk, which is the world's biggest shipping company, usually has two or three really large ships that come into Felixstowe every week. And actually, in recent times, they have been diverting one of those away each week. And uh, we've heard from the head of Global Ocean Network at Maersk, Lars Mikhail Jensen, who said Felixstowe is among the top two or three worst hit terminals. We're having to deviate some of the bigger ships away from Felixstowe and relay some of the smaller ships for cargo. We did it for a while over the summer and now we're starting to do it again. And in real terms, that means that the big ships divert to places like Antwerp and Rotterdam and then the good are put onto these smaller ships and they may actually come back here to Felixstowe but they can go to smaller berths that are around the corner rather than the big berths that the, the, the larger shipping, uh, larger ships require. And the problem is this shortage of HGV drivers that we've heard so much about coming at the time that we're 10 weeks before Christmas. It's the real peak season when it comes to goods coming into the country and all of that together you can see if there's a backlog it all adds up and one thing leads on to another and that's when you see the real difficulties and on top of that here at Felixstowe there are the equivalent of 50,000 20-foot containers backed up here empty containers which the shipping lines are being urged to come and collect to make space for the new imports coming in and actually you know there is a, a little bit of optimism coming from the port of Felix so because they've said actually uh, there is more space now than there's been at any time since the beginning of July so things moving in the right direction but certainly demand is high across the country you will want to buy more and it, it'll be interesting to see what impact this happen has in the weeks ahead on our shops you know as we lead up to Christmas. Emma. And joining us now is Gavin Simmons. He's policy director of uh, the UK Chamber of Shipping. Uh, Mr Simmons, thank you for being with us. Uh, first of all, how big is this problem at the moment? I mean, what, how many ships are being diverted away from, from Felix, though, or, or indeed other British ports at the moment? Uh, good morning, Adam. The, um, well, this, um, the, the, the volume of this is, uh, is unprecedented, um, but it's good, isn't it, to, uh, to hear that the UK economy is, uh, is recovering. Um, and what we're seeing in Felixstowe is, is a local um, example of a, uh, a global problem. So um, uh, I think you've, uh, you've been told that the, um, the supply and demand of, of containers, um, particularly empty containers, is out of balance all around the world following the pandemic. And the lines, the operators are trying to to get the boxes they need where they need them the most. Um, and uh, I think the bad news is that this is going to take a while to uh, to settle. Um, but what you're seeing from both your pictures and and the uh, the, the, the previous uh, interviews um, is is that um, the the maritime uh, logistics chain is really very robust and resilient and flexible. So in shipping terms, um, the diversion of the Maersk um, very large ship uh, to, to Rotterdam um, is not, um, not something you would plan, not something we want to see, but is not unusual. Um, and those containers can be right. um, back fed into the UK. Of course, it's not just containers, it's their contents as well. And that is leading to fears that this winter, particularly at Christmas, people may not have the volume of goods being supplied that they're used to. Is that, is that correct? 
Yeah, I think I think consumers are justifiably sensitive around this. We've had all the um, the Brexit shocks, haven't we, and and the uncertainties of um, our new borders. Um, but this is a, a global problem. Um, if a if a box is taking six weeks to travel from the uh, the Far East, um, I think there are signs that there's quite a bit of stockpiling going on. Um, that um, we, you've heard about the HGV um, driver shortage, um, and that is a particularly acute UK uh, problem. Um, but we're talking about delays here. We're not really talking about shortages. Um, and so things will arrive on the shelves. Uh, they just may not arrive quite uh, in the just-in-time way that we've been led to expect. But um, I think um, in, in our sector, we're pretty confident that all the companies are working together um, to resolve these, these um, global logistics problems and you'll start seeing results uh, coming through. Um, and uh, it may spread into uh, to next year, um, but I don't think we're talking about shortages. We're talking about so, delays at the moment. So, as you say, Britain's going to be particularly badly hit. You've mentioned the lorry drivers. Uh, is, is there also a problem with trading goods because of Brexit? No, there isn't really a Brexit uh, dimension to to this um, this this problem. Um, industries.